Okay, uh, so today we'll be going over uh, tree improvement. So for most of you, this is probably pretty analogous to tree breeding, but what tree improvement actually is, is it combines tree breeding with silviculture. So it's not just breeding better trees, but it's how we then go out and actually deploy those better trees um, and improve growth and other variables based on what we've done. And so we're still in the establishment treatment unit. Um, I, I could have put tree improvement anywhere. Um, it could have gone with the clear cut lecture. It could have gone mid rotation because a lot of what you do throughout the rotation is impacted by your genetics and tree improvement is going to be our really one of our best ways to control genetics. Um, but with tree breeding, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of money. And so we tend to see it deployed for species that are intended to be managed very, very intensively. Um, if your objective is ecological restoration, wildlife aesthetics, many of those things don't require uh, tree improvement for the most part. So let's get you all uh, thinking about this a little bit. So go ahead and pick a tree species that can be grown in the Southern US or here in East Texas. Go ahead and pick a landowner objective and then once you have your tree species and once you have your objective, you need both of those to create a tree improvement program. Go ahead and describe the three traits that you think you would like to breed into your tree. So what would you want to improve um, about your tree? So take a few minutes and once you've got that, see if you can come write it up kind of small on the board here. Okay, uh, so y'all came up with lots of options here. Um, and so a few people basically came up with the same solution for lava only pine for timber management uh, that we'll be going over in detail today, uh, where you're basically looking at different metrics of growth. So height and volume, you know, those are going to be pretty closely correlated where, you know, we use height to estimate site index, higher site index, higher volume, right? And then form or straightness, you know, different ways of kind of saying the same thing, right? Um, so we've got those. We've got slash pine for timber, uh, and you all had uh, stem straightness, self pruning, but also rust resistant, and so that's going to be interesting. So we've got pretty good data from the West Gulf showing that the lava lake pine we've been deploying operationally gets you know less than five percent rust, pretty low rust. Slash pine, that's not the case. It's you know up in the mid twenties. Um, so that would be something that would need to be improved out here. Um, and then it looks like we've come up with a, a number of different hardwood species uh, for timber, or not, sorry, not timber, but wildlife, basically. Um, so we got white oak, sweet gum, and live oak. And so you're looking at improving mast production, larger mast, uh, larger crown, mast volume, uh, decurrent branching. So lots of different things that you're looking at uh, that would improve mast production. Um, so with some of these things, how easy do you think it is, think, think about an evolutionary biology perspective. How easy is it to manipulate the um, reproductive characteristics of a tree? So the fruit, that's one of the reproductive traits. How, how closely um, controlled is that from a natural selection standpoint? If you wanna think about it that way. So if the tree starts making little changes to its fruit characteristics, can that have a big impact? on its ability to survive and reproduce. Yeah, so some of those traits may be more conserved. They may be more difficult to manipulate. Um, other traits may be easier to manipulate. Um, so we'll start going into this a little bit more today. Um, but there's a few things you wanna think about with tree improvement. Let me get the screen share set up again. And you all have gotten into it with these examples. And so the big picture is why are you planting trees? You really can't do tree improvement unless you have an objective. Um, and so without that objective, you just don't have the goal. You don't know what the heck you're trying to do. And so we've already looked at this, you know, where we've got our different silvicultural treatments that we've been doing over time to help improve growth in our Southern pines. And what you notice is that bar on top that's in orange. That's tree improvement. And we keep getting greater and greater and greater volume growth responses out of tree improvement. And so when we start looking at tree improvement and what we've been able to do in the South, 
We plant about 78% of the nation's total seedlings. Um, last few years, I, I don't have any post COVID numbers, but last few years we've been in the mid 800 million seedling per year range. Um, and again, that's just the South. And that's half of what our peak was in the mid eighties. And again, in the mid nineties, we were planting 1.6 billion seedlings per year. And so that's about a million and a half acres. So that's just private landowners and timber companies, you know, doing business as usual, pretty much. Um, and the estimate is that these genetics are worth between 50 and 300 bucks per acre. And that's a net present value number. So that's, you know, you're going to make more money at the end of the rotation, but that's discounted all the way back to present. So that's what that larger amount in the future is worth to you today. Um, and that's also accounting for the higher cost of the better seedlings in terms of their genetics. Uh, so, you know, it, it really seems to be worthwhile. We're doing a whole lot of tree plant. And so this is some data. There are uh, really three or four main co-ops in the South that do a lot of this tree improvement. Um, here in the Western Gulf region, uh, Texas A&M houses the West Gulf Forest Tree Improvement Program. And that's uh, the unit that breeds a lot of the trees we're planting here in East Texas. Um, east of the Mississippi, uh, the co-op that's housed at NC State uh, does a lot of the breeding. And so this is some data from that NC State co-op. Uh, so a guy named Bruce Sobel started here in Texas in the 50s with tree breeding at a &M. And then he ended up going east and going to NC State and starting up this NC State co-op. So it's the largest we have in the south. And so this is some data that they've got uh, showing you how many seedlings were planted in a given year. And they're assuming everything's planted at 600 trees per acre, which is why that other line is basically the exact same line. Uh, but you see those peaks, you know, where they're, you know, up well above a billion seedlings in the mid 80s and the mid 90s. So if we're building a lot of houses, we need a lot of wood. If we need a lot of wood, you harvest a lot of acres. If you harvest a lot of acres, you replant a lot of acres. So a lot of these planting trends are tied into markets and it's gotten even more complex than that uh, now that we have a global economy uh, where wood from the Pacific Northwest may be going to Asia, you know, wood from the South may be going that way. So we're, we're kind of moving everything around all over the place. Now they've been breeding through different cycles and we'll get into that a little more later today, but this is sort of the idea of what are they pulling out of their seed orchards? So you can see that first generation material peaks in the 80s, and then they start putting the second generation material online that peaks in the late 90s, early aughts. Um, and then right about then the third generation material starts coming online. Um, so we've been doing this so long, you know, you basically have the, the grandchildren, if you want to think about it that way, of some of the first trees that we've bred in the breeding program now. You still have great trees from that first generation that are still being sold. So it's not that the later generations completely replace the earlier generations. You may still be selling a mix of first, second, third, fourth, all at once, because some of those first generation selections are still excellent trees. And by and large, it's working. So when you all put slash pine up here, um, here's slash pine volume gain. So you've got the unimproved trees on the left, so there's no gain because that's what you're comparing to. First generation, 12%. Second generation, 23%. So it's working. 23% better volume. And that's at the end of a rotation, basically, 20 years. So working pretty well. So here's sort of the idea with tree improvement. So we've talked about that bell-shaped curve before, right? That normal distribution. So what attributes of a population do you have to have in order to get a bell-shaped curve like that? So when you take statistics, what two numbers would you need to graph out a curve like that? Too early for statistics? Yeah, you need a mean and a standard deviation would work. Uh, some metric of error, right? So that metric, not of error, but of variability. You need that metric of variability. So we have a population that's variable, but, you know, there is an average in there, okay? They all coalesce around the average due to the central limit theorem. And so what you would do then is go take the fantastic individuals at the far right there, breed them together, 
select them and breed them together, and then you get the next population that's still variable, take the best individuals there, select them, breed them together, and so on and so forth. So does this look realistic? If you take the very best trees in your stand, that's the new average for your next cycle of breeding. So you would wish it would happen this way, but unfortunately this isn't how it goes in the real world. Um, this is overly optimistic. So why might those best trees be the best trees? What factors could come into play that leads them to be the tallest and straightest and biggest trees out on a, a particular site? So the site index, that may just be a good site, right? What else? Yeah, microclimate, you know, that tree may have gotten a head start of a few years. You hope that tree is better because of genetics, but you don't know that for a fact. And so that's not how genetic gain really works. This is how it really works. So you take those best individuals and you do improve the population, but it's not this extreme jump at each cycle of tree breeding, okay? And so it works this way basically because we've got a few different components to genetic gain. So there's an equation for you, but we're really just discussing this in a conceptual way. So I'm using that equation to show you the concept here. So to get genetic gain, this is an assumption if we started talking about what are your assumptions to get genetic gain, most of us probably wouldn't even think about it. It would be so underlying an assumption because we're so used to all the populations we deal with being variable. But if you don't have variability in a population, if you go out in a forest and every tree is identical to every other tree, you couldn't pick the best ones. They're all the same, right? And so that's not a forest I think any of us have ever seen, so we don't even think about it. But you need variability in these traits that you want to improve in the trees. Then what you have to do is you have to have that variability be under genetic control, at least to some extent, okay? Because if it's not under genetic control, if it's purely environmental variation, you can't pass it on to the offspring. And then what you have to do is you have to have some level of selection intensity, okay? And so you have to pick the best five, the best 10, the best 20. You're making an artificial decision on selecting the best individuals in that population. So you can already see how this sort of equation works. If we have less variability in a population, are you gonna get less or more genetic gain? So the variability is that sigma sub p, that little circle with the, the arm sticking out to the right. So if that goes down, are you getting less or more genetic gain? You get less. So the more variable the population, the more potential you have for more genetic gain. Okay, look at herit heritability there. So if the trait is more heritable, it's more easily passed along to the offspring. Can you get more genetic gain with that trait? Yeah, the more heritable the trait, the better the genetic gain. And then the higher your selection intensity, the fewer the number of parents you select to move to the next generation, the better your genetic gain. What's the trade-off, however, with a really high selection intensity where you pass very few individuals onto the next cycle? So you've reduced variability. What else have you reduced? So think about it from a basic genetics course standpoint. What, what's an event where you have all of a sudden very few individuals establishing the next population? That's a bottleneck event. Is that generally a good thing or a bad thing when you hear it in the context of population genetics? It, usually you think about it where a few individuals land on an island or there's a near extinction event. Um, in, the, in the context of conservation biology, you have a species that becomes threatened and endangered and there's very few individuals left. And so often we don't think of that as a good thing because then you can get dramatic shifts in the, the gene distribution of that population. Inbreeding can become a problem. And so those are the issues you run into. You drop diversity. And diversity is our hedge against unknown risks. Okay. And so there's the concept of genetic gain. And with heritability, it's not going to equal one. Okay. Now I say it never equals one. Of course, you know, it's hard to say always or never in silviculture, right? So that's not technically true. Where, where is a case that we've already seen this semester in lab where you have an individual and it passes on 100% of its genes to the next tree you put out in the stand? Varietals or clones. So if we clone an individual, 
then we're making copies of it. And so we're not even creating offspring. We're just creating more of that same tree. So the concept of heritability doesn't really apply, but you know, basically you've taken all that genetic variability out of it. Here's an example of how you might apply some of these concepts. So these are different slash pine families at different volumes per plot um, at age 16. That best family on the far right has 85% more volume than the average of all of these. So you take just those best two, do you take just the best five? Do you take the best six there on the far right? You know, you kind of have to decide that and you have to strike a balance in the breeding program. So the more of them you take, you can see, as you include more and more families working your way from right to left, genetic gain goes down because you end up with more of these average families in your population for the next cycle. So let's move along and let's, let's talk about the traits that they've actually focused on in Loblolly Pine. Um, and they focus on these traits in other trees as well. And some of you all have already basically written most of these up here on the board. And so here's what we did for uh, stem volume. So unimproved is our baseline, so it's at zero. Similar data to the slash pine data we looked at, right? 12% increase, 26% increase with second gen. Only 30% in the third gen, but th there's that little asterisk and it says it's unrobed, okay? So if you're doing all this, are you gonna be perfect every time or you think you're gonna make mistakes? You're gonna make a lot of mistakes, okay? You all have been out in a seed orchard uh, with Dr. Kidd in ecology. So you've seen those trees out in the seed orchard, hopefully. And when you're out in the seed orchard, if you've made a mistake and you realize that's not a good parent like we thought it was gonna be, how do you fix that mistake in that context? Cut it down. <laughs> so that's called roguing the seed orchard. Okay, so you get a chainsaw out and you cut it down. You thought that tree was good, you were wrong. You remove it from the population. What's that do to the selection intensity? It increases selection intensity. So what's that do to genetic gain? It's gonna increase genetic gain. So after they rogue that third generation and remove the mistakes, selection intensity goes up, genetic gain goes up. That 30% becomes closer to 37% um, is what we've seen. They did a lot of work improving stem straightness, okay? And so this is what a stand might have looked like. Yeah, you know, you can see that's an older photo. And so this is what a stand would have looked like out there with unimproved trees being planted. And in the first cycle of tree breeding, they moved us more towards this, okay? Think about the portable sawmill exercise that some of you have done at Field Station, some of you will be doing. So, you know, if Dr. McRoom gave you one of those trees, and told you, cut me nice straight boards out of it, would you be happy? Or would you rather be in the group that got one of these trees? Yeah, that would be easier to work with. Everything would be easier about that. Value went up by about 20%, not because volume increased, just because straightness increased. They were able to recover more boards per ton that they hauled into the mills because the trees were straight. Um, so they've improved stem straightness. Um, what's a big environmental risk for growing our forests out here in the Western Gulf region that they don't see as much east of the Mississippi? Slip. Yeah, but you know, when you look at where you're going to get, um, you know, that storm surge, you probably don't have much pine down there. Uh, these pines don't handle salt well, right? And so if you're along the coast, you tend to get into prairies, right? So what are some other environmental events we see in the West Gulf that they don't really see east of the Mississippi? Drought's going to be the big one. So for a while there, they were breeding drought-hardy pines here in Texas. The goal was just to make sure the seedlings could survive. Well, the downside with that is they took some genetics from the lost pines, that population near Bastrop, because that's, you know, this disjunct population, the far western distribution of Wabali, they're pretty drought-hardy but they had terrible stem form. So yeah, we got survival, but you know, it was survival of trees that look like that. So you may still see some old drought hardy plantations out there in our area. And you can usually identify them because you walk out there and you're like, these trees are just terrible. So they may be saw timber size, but they're all pulp wood, so. Okay, uh, fusiform rust has been an issue in the South. And so you get galls on branches, you get galls on the main stem, it'll kill trees, it'll degrade trees. You know, you're not gonna get saw timber out of a tree that has significant fusiform rust on the main stem. Um, it's naturally occurring. This is not an invasive species and we find it in the soil. Here's the uh, 
fusiform rust hazard rating map. And so you can see most of the state of Georgia is red. This is where the University of Georgia took their school colors from. Um, so what you'll notice there is we have much less risk west of the Mississippi and a lot more risk east of the Mississippi. There's a theory on why that happened. At the peak of the last glacial period 18,000 years ago, the glaciers pushed down pretty south and they pushed Loblolly Pine south and so it would have gone into two refugia, one in Florida, one in Texas and Mexico. And the refugia in Texas and Mexico, fusiform rust was there. So the trees were evolving with it. In Florida, it wasn't there, so the trees weren't evolving with it. Well, then they moved back north after the glaciers recede, and you get limited contact between the populations across the Mississippi River Valley. If you look at the range map for Loblolly, there's a gap for the, the Mississippi River Valley there where it's really not found. But fusiform rust makes it to the east, and it's new for those trees, they're not resistant to it. And so you end up with lots of problems there, east of the Mississippi with rust. Um, but fortunately what we figured out is you can breed for rust resistance. And so they've taken Western Gulf sources resistant to rust and they've bred them into those Eastern Loblolly Pines. And here's data from Rainier, okay? So this might be in Georgia, for example, where they were having major problems with rust and then in the mid 70s, they start deploying rust resistant sources and those infection rates drop again to 5% or less about. So this is an example of a disease that we could actually breed around, which isn't super common, right? Can you breed and fix Southern pine beetles? Not that we found. Um, we'd love to breed ash and make it resistant to emerald ash borer, but a lot of these insects, it's difficult to breed some sort of resistance uh, for but some of these other pathogens you can. Uh, with fusiform rust in Loblolly, they've actually located eight different genes, eight different loci that confer resistance. So it kind of works like a combination lock. If I gave you a combination lock with one wheel, you could crack into that pretty quickly and easily. But if I gave you a combination lock with eight wheels, you know, you'd be bored, you'd give up. I mean, some of you, by the time you're done in the classroom today, you could probably, you know, get through it, but um, you have all 13 hours, but um, you know, if you had all eight of those resistance genes, it's gonna be hard for the pathogen to evolve around it. So that's the analogy. Okay, so we're breeding for faster growth. We're breeding for stem straightness. We're breeding for more resistance to disease. Are we breeding for a specific product here at all? We really aren't breeding for a specific problem. Volume's the main thing we're focused on. And there's a good reason for that. So let's think about the time scale of this. You go out, you find the best trees. How long does it take them to produce cones? Two years, right? Two growing seasons from pollination, okay? You can sample your trees, you can put them into a clone bank. That's gonna take them, you know, you graft it to the slash pine rootstock. It's gonna take you, you know, a few years to grow it to reproductive maturity. Those cones then take a couple years to produce seed. Then you've got to plant that seed out. You've got to test it. Then you've got to get it into a seed orchard. So this is taking you, you know, 15, 20 years minimum, okay? Then you take the seedlings that you've bred for a specific product that's taking you 15 to 20 years to do. You plant them out in the ground in an operational plantation, and it's another 25 years before you're harvesting trees. So you may be looking at like 45 years between when you start all this effort and when you actually reap the benefits. So that, that's kind of crazy to think about, right? So this is a really long-term investment, but think about how that worked with our markets in the South. You say, we're gonna breed for plywood. We have great plywood mills around here. It's a high value product. By the time you're harvesting these trees, you bred for great plywood, OSB was invented. <laughs> you don't have nearly as many plywood mills anymore. And you can take a pulpwood tree to an OSB mill and chip it up and make a very similar product. So we're seeing mass timber, all this other stuff going on. So it's really difficult to breed for a specific product. Really, we just breed with the idea of if we get more trees out there and they're easier trees to work with, they're straighter and, you know, diseases are affecting them less, you know, we'll figure out what we're going to do with them later, but we've got more of them and they're easier to work with. So we don't really breed toward a specific product. Now, as we're doing all these things, often what we find is trees are complex, right? these traits are governed by not one gene, not two genes, but maybe thousands of genes. 
So as we breed for them to grow faster and grow straighter, that may not be ideal with other traits. So if you're breeding a tree that's growing faster, you're gonna have fewer growth rings per inch, right? They're putting on more diameter each year. And so that may not be good for wood properties. And so we've seen this uh, where different organizations have degraded uh, standards for Southern pine. Um, and we've seen slight reductions in specific gravity, the density of the wood. Um, some mills won't take trees below a certain age. We'll actually count the rings on the trucks. And it's because we didn't used to be able to grow trees that big that quickly, but now we can. And so it's, it's, you know, a work in progress, but it's hard to optimize all traits. And so the other thing is if, if you're doing this tree breeding program, okay. And in wood tech, are you all still doing the lab where you take the, the pieces and you put them in the machine, you get MOR, MOE, not doing that anymore. Well, you know, if you want to sample wood, what do you have to do to the tree? Cut it down. Yeah. So, you know, you're out there, you're cutting trees down, you're, you know, milling wood out of them, you're testing the wood. Is that expensive, labor intensive, time intensive? Yeah, and then that tree's dead, it's not there in your test anymore. You can't keep testing it. And so we've largely ignored wood properties just because we did not have the resources to intensively sample them. But now they have all sorts of other technology. You can go out there and you can put an acoustic detector in the tree, hit it with a hammer looking tool, and it'll estimate some of those wood properties for you. Uh, stiffness, flexibility, other traits. And so now you can sample thousands of trees non-destructively, and you can consider breeding for some of these traits that have been more difficult to quantify in the past. Um, some of this is just dumb luck. So one of the best trees they found was on the seventh time they went out looking for trees. It was the 56th tree they found. So very creatively, they named it 756. Um, but it turned out to be one of the best volume produ producers we've ever found. It came out of South Carolina and they started putting it everywhere. It does tend to fork a lot, but you know, for a pulpwood market, it's a great tree. But they started looking at it and it turned out it had this rare allele, the cat in one allele. And what that did is it altered lignin biosynthesis so that these trees produced wood that just you know, was a little easier to run through a pulp mill. Okay, and so they found that just by dumb luck. So, um, so there's all sorts of stuff going on out there with wood properties these days, especially as we move into varietal silviculture. Now you can, you know, with varietal silviculture, think about this. It's difficult to optimize selection of all traits, but you just need that one weird tree that does it. And if you can clone it, now you've done that. Okay, so. So in these tree improvement programs, you're really trying to avoid a lot of these poor phenotypes. And so these are the defective trees we looked at in that PT to lab, right? Where you had all those different defects on them. So you're trying to avoid all that. Okay, so I've already talked about two of these tree improvement programs. The third that I didn't mention was at the University of Florida. Um, that's where a lot of the slash pine breeding uh, is at and they have a really good genetics program there as well. Uh, but these three breeding programs, basically they have industry members. So companies like Rayonier, Warehouser, Hancock, they'll be members in these. Um, and their membership entitles them to the data. And so they can use that data to start deciding which trees they're gonna plant on their lands. And so because this is such an expensive and long-term endeavor, a lot of these co-ops will share genetics, germplasm, they'll basically share genetics with one another. And so if you think about it, you know, so we, we just had Hurricane Laura move through Louisiana with high winds. If you had um, a clone bank out there, so you had taken grafts of trees and grown them up so that you would keep them and you would have them for long term. And this hurricane goes through your clone bank and breaks all your trees. You don't want to lose those genetics, right? But those so, same trees may have been grafted out in Florida and may have been grafted out in Alabama and North Carolina. And so they're still out there somewhere, so you're not going to lose them. And so by working together, you know, these co-ops can ensure uh, that this process is long term and sustainable. So this is an example from Douglas fir, but it applies in Southern Pine. I know that may be kind of small for somebody in the back there. Uh, but the first take home message you can see from this is tree improvement is complicated. Okay, there are a lot of steps that go on in a tree improvement program. Um, it's very time intensive. It's very data intensive. Okay, 
Uh, so as we look at this, you kind of have a breeding cycle and a production cycle. So the production cycle is on the right, the breeding cycle is on the left. But your end goal here is to put improved seedlings um, in the hands of landowners so they can put them in the ground and grow a forest with them. But to get to that, you have to do a lot of different steps. So as we start looking at the different steps, first you have to find good trees. So there's an example of a tree in Alabama that was 126 feet tall. Some of these trees are still out there. A few years ago, I took a class up to cross at Arkansas at the Experimental Forest, and they've got one of the trees from the first cycles of tree breeding still there, still growing. A lot of this work might have happened in the 50s and 60s. So some of these trees have died since the original trees, but again, we still have grafted scions from them growing in clone banks all over the South. So while the original tree is dead, we haven't lost the genetics of it. So you pick the best tree. As you're picking the best tree, you're measuring other trees around it in the stand to make sure that tree is really good for that site uh, because you don't just wanna have a good tree just because every tree out there is really good. That happens to be a good site. You want the genetics to be good. So there's a lot of research that's done to sort of separate the effects of genetics and the effects of environment. Then you take it and someone may climb to the top of it and clip a scion out of it. You may shoot a scion out of it uh, but they bring it back, they graft it to a rootstock, and they get it growing in a clone bank. Well, think about the data that this is going to take. This is just going to look like a plantation, but you need to track out what the genetics are of every tree in that plantation are. You have to keep track of all this. So you have to mark it, and you have to mark it in a way or, you know, where you keep replacing markings as they fall off. So very data, time, labor intensive. Then what you want to do with that clone bank, you think those are good trees, but you don't know yet. And what they've also found is that some trees are what they call good general combiners. They'll breed with lots of other trees and pass their genetics on and make good offspring. Some trees aren't, where they just don't breed well with other trees, even though that was a good tree, it seems to not pass those good genetics on. And so you want to find all that out. And so we'll talk next class about mass control pollination, but a lot of this is similar. You cover the female strobili before they become receptive, so not just any pollen can get in there. And then you inject them with pollen from a known father tree, so you've controlled the cross. But then again, that cone's gonna take two growing seasons to mature, so now you've gotta keep track of that cone. <laughs> you have to know the, the two parents on it. So again, very data intensive. Then once you get that seed, you grow it in your nursery for a year, and then you go and you plant it out in a progeny test. And so again, you're still in the nursery, you have to know who the two parents are. This is a different plantation you've established where silviculture is very high. You tried to find a uniform site so environment doesn't vary. And then you used really good herbicide, you may have fertilized. You're trying to take this site and make it as uniform as possible so environmental variation, it's never gonna be zero, but as close as you can get. Okay, but you still have to know what the mother and father of each of the trees are, are out there. Um, you can see it established at one year, and I don't think I've ever seen a, an operational pine plantation that clean at one year old, right? But then what we find is you have to grow them out to about six years. And the age-age correlation, we don't really care about a six-year-old plantation, right? You know, it's not commercial yet. We care about that end of the rotation plantation. We care about a 25-year-old plantation. But it turns out the age-age correlation between six and 25 is pretty good. The tallest trees at age six are gonna be the tallest trees at age 25. And so you grow them out to age six, you measure your progeny test, and then you've learned what are my winners, what are my losers. And so you can see the poor family on the left, you know, lots of mortality, small trees, versus the good family on the right there, where the trees have all survived, they're large, they're tall, they're straight. So you found the winners, you found the losers, and, uh, you know, this is where that poor family on the left, that's not good news for mama. So you rode, the, you rode the clone bank. So you go and you take the mistakes you made out of there with the chainsaw. So cut down uh, the, the trees that didn't quite work out. And on that photo, you can see the graft line uh, right up above where it was cut. And so when you go out into these clone banks or seed orchards, you'll see where they kind of flute in and then go up straight. And that'll be the graft line. Okay, but now you know what the winners are, but this clone bank might not be able to produce quite enough seed yet to get to the nurseries. So now you have to develop a seed orchard. And so what you can do is go take clippings out of that clone bank, graft them out in a seed orchard, 
And here's an example of a Midwest Vaco seed orchard that was established in 1986. And then that bottom photo is 2001. So you're taking six years to test them. Here's another 15 years to get the seed orchard into production. And it's just taking a long time to move through one cycle because we're dealing with a perennial long live crop, you know, trees. And so once you have that seed orchard up and running, there you go. Now you can sell improved seed to nurseries that can sell improved seedlings to landowners. And so we'll get into this more next class, but a lot of these seed orchards will be open pollinated where you know they don't try to control what pollen hits those cones, but you know that all those mother trees, because these pines are monoecious, right? So each of them is a father tree and a mother tree. The seed's gonna be coming off the mother trees, obviously. And so you know that that's improved seed. So, so again, that's sort of, there it is all on one slide again, but you can see it's, it's very complex, lots of different steps, lots of data you have to keep track of. So those of you that'll be taking intensive silviculture next semester, this is about a third of the class. So we'll get into it in a lot more detail. So that's usually the urban forestry students and the timber management students. Okay, so that's how we do tree improvement. Uh, what I wanna do now is shift gears a little bit and uh, let's look at how we move trees around within a region and how we move trees around throughout the world. And so we need to know a few different terms first. And so we need to know the difference between a provenance and a seed source. Provenance is the area the tree's actually adapted to. That's what's important. Seed source is just where did we get the seed from most recently. That really doesn't matter as much. And so here's an example where if you had trees and the original parent tree before it went into the breeding program came from the Atlantic Coastal Plain in South Carolina, those are the conditions that tree is adapted to. Because remember, evolution, adaptation occurs between generations, not within a generation. Okay, it occurs by the winners being able to re reproduce and pass their genes on and the losers not being able to survive, reproduce or pass their genes on. And so that tree, if we planted it here in the West Gulf, probably not well suited to drought. You could run into some drought mortality, right? However, here's an example where if we took that Atlantic Coastal Plain provenance, planted it in East Texas, put it into a seed orchard, and then sent it to Mississippi, you know, the seed source might be East Texas, but that tree is still adapted to South Carolina. So that tree might actually do pretty well in Mississippi. Because South Carolina and Mississippi, you know, may have similar climates, you know, they don't have that severe risk of drought, and so it may work pretty well. And it's real important to know what that provenance is, because they'll vary, and I'll show you a bunch of examples here. They vary in all sorts of different factors, growth rate, cold tolerance, drought, disease resistance, stem form. So I've already given you examples of some of those, right? Bastard pines have poor stem form. You know, fusiform rust is worse east of the Mississippi, but we can fix that. Drought tolerance, we see that in bastard pines and other West Gulf pines. Cold tolerance is going to be more of a north-south gradient, right? Colder up north, warmer down south, and that's going to impact growth rate. So as we start looking at that, um, here's a map from a, a pretty good uh, publication that's out there. This is freely available by Schmidling. Um, but basically it just shows what we've been doing. So because they're not resistant to drought, those Atlantic coastal plain trees tend to grow faster. They have sort of a less conservative approach to, to growth in the growing season because they're not as worried about getting hit by a drought. So if they're growing better, we're gonna plant them somewhere else, right? So we took them from the Carolinas and other areas over there in the Atlantic coastal plain and we have planted a bunch of them in Southeast Oklahoma, Southwestern Arkansas, uh, East Texas, and Louisiana. So we've planted a whole bunch of them. Honestly, we haven't really seen too many episodes of severe drought mortality or anything like that. It seems to be working okay. Um, and so, you know, when you go look at plantations in Arkansas and Oklahoma, a lot of those trees came from the Carolinas, Georgia, that sort of region. The other thing we've done, uh, slash pine is not native west of the Mississippi. Its furthest west extent is southeastern Louisiana. Well, we've taken slash pine and it does better on some of our wetter sites than Loblolly will. And we've moved a lot of slash pine into southeast Texas and southwestern Louisiana. And so all the slash pine you see in the West Gulf, it wasn't here before we put it here in the last 60, 70 years. 
The third thing we've done, you can see there is one arrow to the right. Fusiform rust was a big problem east of the Mississippi. And so we've taken trees primarily from Livingston Parish, Louisiana, where they found some that were really resistant to fusiform rust. And we've moved those trees to the east into that breeding program. And that, I already showed you that data where those trees became rust resistant. That was that move from west to east. And so what do we find? Those western sources are slower growing, but more drought tolerant. And what you would expect by deploying Atlantic coastal plain sources out here in the West Gulf, bump your site index up eight feet, okay? Those trees grow eight feet taller over a 25 year period. What we find if I took a tree that was adapted to Southern Arkansas and I planted it down in Newton County or Jasper County, so more Southeast Texas, I've moved it South. Well, think about what that tree is gonna do. That tree's gonna say, oh crap, winter's coming, stop growing. And then the growing season's fine for another month, two months. So it missed an opportunity out on some growth. And so when you move trees from, from north to south, you know, that carpetbagger tree, if you will, it just doesn't succeed there. So no one's doing that. No one's advising moving from the north to the south. Um, however, if you move from the south to the north, those trees tend to be pretty successful uh, because they continue growing when the local sources shut down. So we have been moving trees from south to north, but you can't go too far. If you go too far, they keep growing, they keep growing, and then that first cold hits and they'll get a lot of cold damage, maybe even mortality. So let me show you some examples of that, okay? Um, so on the left, you see trees from Florida growing in Florida. The technical term for those trees would be rust buckets, right? So that's fusiform rust, and you can see there's massive degrades there. Well, we know everything's better in Texas, right? So if you take these trees from Texas and plant them in Florida, they do great. Uh, they're resistant to fusiform rust where our infection rates are typically 5% or less out here. Um, so you can move trees from West Gulf to the East and fix rust. Here's trees from Louisiana. And again, Livingston Parish is those real rust resistant trees. Here they are growing in Virginia. And so you can see they're, they're kind of small there, that row of trees. Here's Florida trees moved up to Virginia. There aren't trees there anymore. You moved them too far north, cold damage killed them, okay? So Louisiana to Virginia may not be too far north, but Florida to Virginia was too far north. And here's what that might look like as it was happening. So there's trees planted in, the, in Virginia. So, you know, if you get into Virginia, that's gonna be some of the colder areas within the range of Blavoli Pine. And so on the coastal plain source on the left there, it's adapted to warmer areas. The more inland Piedmont source can handle a little more cold. And so you saw the cold damage and that pine on the left is dead pretty much, uh, whereas the pine on the right is not. So that's, and you can see that Piedmont source got a little bit of cold damage. There's some brown on the tips of the limbs, but that tree is gonna survive. Um, I did some research on some pines we had planted in Virginia uh, when I was there working on my PhD. And what we found is the trees that grew the fastest got the worst cold damage, which kind of makes sense because they've got that actively growing shoot more susceptible to cold damage. But the, the cold damage over that winter that I looked at wasn't too severe. It was minor cold damage. So those trees also grew the fastest the next year as well. So it wasn't as severe a cold damage as this. So unless you get into incidences of mortality, you know, it may still be okay to plant those trees there. So you put all those trends together and people have come up with different guidelines on how you should move genetics around or not move genetics around. So this is out of that Schmittling paper where basically keep Texas and Oklahoma trees in Texas and Oklahoma because drought's a real problem. Then you have Louisiana and Arkansas as a Western district. Um, and then basically once you're east of the Mississippi, the drought risk is similar anywhere. And so east of the Mississippi, you can move trees all over between states and it's not a big deal. Then you see those dotted lines that sort of governs how far north or south you wanna move the trees. So don't be taking trees from Newton County and try and move them up into Southeast Oklahoma. You risk a lot of cold damage. And it's not just cold, ice damage can be a big deal there as well. Uh, Schmidt is not the only guideline out there. Here's another example of some similar regions where you could think about moving Southern Pines around and you know, similar overall trends there. Some of you probably use USDA hardiness zones. If you get into horticulture, you use these a lot. Zone five plants, zone eight plants, right? 
And so we're, we're here in zone eight in East Texas for the most part, but there's a rule of thumb here. This doesn't help you with moving trees east west, but it does with north south. Keep it under two full USDA hardiness zones. Um, so if you look at that kind of tan color towards southeast Houston, or southeast Texas, so again, if we're looking at, you know, areas there in southeast Texas, you can see you wouldn't want to move them up into southeast Oklahoma because that moves you from the dark tan to the light tan into that reddish pink color. So that's two full zones. You would want to keep it less than that. So, and of course, they update these USDA hardiness zones from time to time so that they'll change over time. Okay, so that's all focused on southern pine, but these same trends apply to other species. I was just using southern pine as an example. Um, and we have a lot of breeding in southern pine here in the south. So what you see on the right here um, is you can see those little numbers, 16 and 20 were the furthest south in Oregon. This is all grand fur that they sampled in these areas. Um, and then you can see some of these other populations, 001 is the furthest north, 003. If you look in there real close, you can see Sally on a boat. Um, but what they did is they took grand fir from all these different locations in the Pacific Northwest, and they all planted them at one site in Poland. So see that little inset map to the bottom right? So there they planted them in Southern Poland. And so they actually would have moved them a little further north in terms of latitude lines, but you have a little bit of different climate because of how the, the Gulf Stream cycles um, in the Atlantic Ocean. But what they found is, what they're showing you is growth of those trees. And what you notice is the two southern sources on the right grew the least in Poland compared to those more northern sources. Cold damage, they moved them too far north, okay? So here's the exact same thing playing out in a completely different species, moved between continents. So these same overall trends are gonna apply. If you look at grand fir or even Douglas fir, a really important commercial species out west, they have topography out there. So you may only wanna move them to certain elevations because moving a tree north 250 miles is gonna be similar in many cases to moving it up a thousand feet vertically in elevation, okay? So it gets really complex out in the Pacific Northwest where you do have mountainous topography. This can be complex in the Rockies, the Appalachians, all these different mountainous regions where we're trying to plant trees. I didn't talk at all about hybrids, but we have a lot of hybrid poplar in the Pacific Northwest. I showed you this uh, graph in Dendro, many of you, uh, but this gets at the idea of heterosis or hybrid vigor. And hybrid vigor is just the idea that a hybrid of two species can actually be better than either of the parent species. So what is it, a mule is a hybrid of a donkey and a horse, and it can have more sustained strength at pulling things than either of them, so it's better than either parent. Um, and so these are a few different hybrids between different poplars, Populus deltoides, Populus nigra, and Populus trichocarpa. You see they have stem circumference on the left. So geneticists, you know, don't use diameters. They, they measure around things for some reason. But, and what you're seeing is these hybrids, that's the percent that they're better than either of the parents. So you're seeing good hybrid vigor on some of these poplars. So they've deployed more than 50,000 acres of hybrid poplars out in the Pacific Northwest. And again, keep in mind that 100 cubic feet is about three tons. So if you could get 600 cubic feet per acre per year, that's a mean annual increment of 18 tons per acre per year. That would be up there. That would be pretty good. Uh, 350, you know, that's going to be giving us 10, 11. And so the lower end of that range is going to be similar to sort of our real high end for loblolly pine. Uh, but the idea there is you're not growing saw timber if you're cranking growth that fast but you could grow short rotation crops for biomass energy. Um, they're looking at ways where you can take these fast grown trees and peel them and maybe use that uh, to create laminate plywood for boats, ships. Um, so all sorts of specialty ideas out there, but you could put them on pretty short rotations and get yourself some pretty good volume pretty quickly with these hybrid poplars. Um, often when they're looking at these, they are looking at varietal stands. So they're looking at those clonal stands. And of course, other than moving those grand fur to Poland, everything we've been talking about so far is really focused on native species. We're fortunate here in the US, you know, I asked you in the Southern US to come up with a landowner objective and you were able to find native species that met that landowner objective that we have here. So we're fortunate. And then with species like Lavalle, we're fortunate in that they grow really well and they can meet that objective really well. 
other regions in the world don't have that. They have objectives, but they look around their forest and they may not have native trees that can meet those objectives. And so based on that, you know, they've had to go to some exotics. So they planted a lot of radiata pine, which remember grows on, you know, a small island off the coast of California, a few small islands. So its native range is almost non-existent, but it's one of the most widely planted pines in the world. And here it is in Australia, and that map on the bottom is the North Island of New Zealand. And so they're managing them like crazy down there. Um, it's actually caused some problems. It grows so well that it's dropping the water table in some areas and drying up small creeks. And uh, so they're, they're trying to constrain where they plant it because it's actually caused some environmental problems. I showed you all this in Dendro when we looked at trees of Australia, but there's eucalyptus. And so, you know, they've planted eucalyptus all over the world. And remember, it sits there in Australia under conditions of severe drought and just survives. And then it gets a little rain, photosynthesizes like crazy and grows when it can. But then you move it to Brazil or China or South Africa, regions where there's more consistent rainfall throughout the year. And it just grows like crazy all the time. So lots of eucalyptus out there for pulp. So. Any questions on tree improvement? 